Welcome back to this third video on latent TB management in community settings, in which we'll be looking at initiating treatment. So far, you've thought about TB, and after having done a latent TB test in excluded active disease, you've made a diagnosis of latent tuberculosis infection. Before we start treatment then, let's just review the testing that you've done so far. Depending on the background and the context of the person in front of you, of course, you might have arranged a range of other appropriate tests as well. But this represents the minimum that you need in terms of having all the information to safely initiate therapy. You'll have a test for latent TB, either a MAN2 test or an interferon gamma release assay, and a chest x-ray, which has been part of making sure they don't have active TB. The one other thing that I haven't mentioned yet is that you need a set of liver function tests, because having abnormal liver function, specifically the ALT and AST, at the start of treatment, puts people at increased risk of adverse effects. When you're assessing if the benefit of treatments outweighs the risks, abnormal liver function tests can tip that balance then, and specialist assessment is appropriate. One logistic question is, when should the liver function tests be done? Personally, my preference is to order these at the same time as the interferon gamma release assay, so that there's only one set of tests being done together. This does mean that some people with a negative latent TB test will have LFTs performed, but it avoids having multiple blood tests. So, the individual who's under 35, has got latent TB infection and normal liver function tests, is appropriate to offer treatment. There are several different treatments available for latent TB, but daily isoniazid therapy for six months is widely used, and is the only latent TB medication currently available on the PBS. Isoniazid has few drug interactions, with the older anti-epileptic drugs valproate, carbamazepine, and phenytoin having some increased serum levels. Isoniazid comes as 100 mg tablets, and it's given as 10 mg per kilogram, up to a total of 300 mg, which means that virtually all adults will get three tablets once a day. We're going to talk in a moment about potential side effects, but along with the isoniazid, prescribing 25 mg of pyridoxine, or vitamin B6, is also used to avoid risk of peripheral neuropathy, which can rarely occur in those with severe B6 deficiency. If your patient has none of the issues that we've talked about, that's fine. But there may have been some red flags as you review them. You might think that they're at higher risk of side effects, such as if they have abnormal liver function tests before starting, or you might have found that they have other conditions or treatment which could alter their risk or benefit. For these people, it's very appropriate to refer them for specialist review, which is most likely to be the infectious diseases unit of your local hospital. Some of these people may well be appropriate for treatment even if they don't meet the guidelines we're using here, but specialist assessment and close monitoring may be required, or alternative therapies may be more appropriate. To give you some idea of what this looks like in practice, we prospectively studied 100 consecutive people receiving isoniazid through the Royal Melbourne Hospital, looking closely at side effects and treatment completion. Now, this was a higher risk group who were older and had a range of other comorbidities, and because of their higher risk, they also got a longer nine-month course of isoniazid. Overall, then, we'd expect them to be at higher risk of side effects from treatment. We found that the most common issues were mild gastrointestinal side effects, particularly nausea after the first few doses. We also saw that a small number had some sleep disturbance, and there were no issues with peripheral neuropathy, no hospitalizations, and 88 of the 100 completed the nine months of treatment as planned. So when I'm talking to someone about potential side effects, I'll tell them that for most people who take the treatment, there are no significant side effects, and the biggest challenge is taking tablets regularly over a six-month course. I say that the most important side effect is hepatitis, which happens to around one in 300 people. And if they had abdominal pain, persistent nausea, or jaundice, they should stop taking treatment and come for review. I also say that other side effects can occur, but they tend to be mild, and most people finish therapy as planned. Of course, it's important for people to know that they should let you know about anything they're concerned about while on treatment. Bringing this all together, let's imagine a pretty typical 23-year-old who migrated from India a few years ago, and now you've found that she has latent TB. Over the rest of her life, she probably has something like a 3 to 5% chance of developing active TB, which could be increased in the future if she was to need some immune-suppressing treatment or develop diabetes. 
You'd like to give her some treatment to prevent reactivation, but you want to make sure that the benefits of treatment outweigh the risk of any harm. So you take a history and find that she has no other comorbidities or medications, she's well, and she has a normal chest x-ray and liver function. This is a perfect time to talk to them about their risk for TB in the future and to offer a course of isoniazid to greatly reduce that risk. Not everyone will be that straightforward, though, and some people will be screened out by this approach. Here's a 47-year-old man who you've known for some time after he migrated back in 2012. He's got diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis, which is poorly controlled, and his rheumatologist thinks that he might need a biological agent in the future. So what are the red flags here? Well, he's older, and he's on a drug with liver toxicity as its main side effect, so there's a higher risk of hepatitis from isoniazid. He's also got diabetes, and he's undergoing some immunosuppressive therapy, which will increase his risk of getting TB. Now, it's not straightforward to weigh up those factors and decide whether treatment for latent TB is a good idea. So this would be a good person to send on for review and discussion about whether latent TB therapy is appropriate. Okay, so that's a quick overview of initiating latent TB therapy, which can be safe and effective when targeted appropriately. Next time, we'll keep going and talk about follow-up and monitoring while on treatment to make sure that we can help people finish well after getting underway.